Do you inherently dislike media with a right-wing subtext? No, not inherently. I think media can be good while also being pretty right-wing, you know? Like, for example, there are plenty of things in the movie 300 that are just awesome, you know? Um, but the, the, the movie's subtext is, is, is border... Like, is, is downright fascist, almost. Um, but yeah, there are parts of the movie that are fucking awesome. I just want people to be aware of it. Is the Dark Knight Trilogy good despite being right-wing? Um, I think it's pretty good. I don't think it's amazing, you know? Like, I think there's a reason that in retrospect, when people think Dark Knight, Christopher Nolan Trilogy, they just think of Heath Ledger's Joker, because that part of it was really, really, really good. I think the, uh, the Christopher Nolan Dark Knight Trilogy is, um, is good, but, like, you guys would agree that generally people remember, um, you know, Heath Ledger's Joker, and that's, like, the main thing that they think of, right? For example, most people don't really talk about the first or third ones. Like, no one talks about the first movie in the trilogy, and in the third one, I only ever see people making, like, memes about Bane, but not really ones that refer to the quality of Bane as a character, or, you know, but just, like, memes because he had, like, a funny voice, or he's just kind of an interesting character. And don't get me wrong, I like the character of Bane, I think that he's good meme material, but... His death did a huge part in amplifying um, it, but he did give a really good performance. Yeah, of course. It's it's kind of like the, you know, the brightest candles burn out the fastest thing. His performance was fantastic, but giving a phenomenal performance and then fucking dying right after absolutely does elevate the, um, you know, in, in the public eye, it does, like, sort of elevate your, um, your performance. What do you think of Tom Hardy as an actor? What... When I, when I think of Tom Hardy as an actor, the main thing that I think about, honest to God, is his performance in the awful Star Trek The Next Generation movie. The last one that was ever made with the cast of The Next Generation, where everyone's so old and tired. Um, what was the name of it? What, what was the name of that one? The last, the last movie um, of that. Nemesis, that's right. Nemesis. God. What a what an awful What an awful movie. Yeah, Star Trek Retirement House. Jesus Christ. He was a Nemesis? He was the main antagonist in Nemesis, yeah. Okay, remind me. In Nemesis was the mega ultra powerful ship the Enterprise. It's it's so weird how in the next generation, the television show the majority of the plots of every episode were social and political in nature. Very rarely was it just like, there's an enemy that we have to defeat. You know what I mean? Like, very rarely in The Next Generation was that the plot of an episode. It was usually social or political or ethical dilemmas. But in every TNG movie, it's like, here's the big enemy you have to defeat, you know? And I'm asking, in, 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 in that movie the ship that Tom Hardy controlled, was it the mining ship or was it just the super powerful battleship? Because I remember in one of the Star Trek movies, they were facing a mining ship that was like stupidly strong because it was from a different time or something. It was a battleship. So was the mining ship from the first modern Star Trek movie? It was the, the reboot. Okay, gotcha, okay. I did like that idea in concept, you know? Because um, in, in, in Star Trek, the Enterprise, which is where, you know, the, the Enterprise, that, that ship, it's the flagship of the Federation, and it's not a warship. Um, it's obviously very advanced and well-equipped for war to defend itself if needed, but it's not a warship. It has diplomats and scientists on board. It's not fully outfitted with weapons. It has scientific apparatus and equipment, and holy shit, you know, stuff like that. Um, so I always thought it was cool that the, um, it was optimistic, basically. Like, the, the universe of the show was one in which the flagship of a military organization cannot be a war vessel. Isn't that interesting? Like, as a concept, right? The Federation was a, was a, a military alliance, in part, you know? The people who controlled the Enterprise were military officers, but their flagship was not a military, um... was not a uh, was not a warship 
Oh my god, stop! Run out of mana! Have I seen Deep Space Nine? No, but I really want to. I've heard it's really good, like TNG tier, you know. The Enterprise still had strong defenses? Oh yeah, of course, absolutely. It had plenty of weapons, don't get me wrong. Um, and it was crewed by soldiers, but... I do play it on my own time, Rest of Magpie. Um, anyway, in the first reboot Star Trek movie, uh, the Enterprise, commanded by Captain James T. Kirk, goes up against... It's like a mining ship from the future, right? Like, it's just a mining ship, but the point is that 200 years of technological advancements means that the mining ship of the near future, or like 200 years in the future, are, is... Um, Future alternate dimension. Yeah, like that on its own is enough to match the Enterprise. Or or beat it, actually. It crushes them. Not even close. Like, their mining ship was capable of, like, destroying planets, you know? Um, it was spliced with Borg tech, yeah. The main thing I remember from that movie is that they completely fucked everything up. Oh, God. That in order to solve a problem, they invented some new shit that, like broke all the rules of Star Trek. They invented a warp technology that allows you to transport onto another ship in warp flight when their shields are up. I don't remember much about the rules for transporting during warp flight, but the rule of Star Trek has always been you can never, ever transport a person through shields. Ever. You can never do that. And it was a good rule because it, you know, it makes sense. And, um... It enables, um, interesting decision-making. Man, a lot of people have died up here. The reboot spit on all established canon. It's just, Star Trek was cool because it was unique. It was optimistic sci-fi, you know? Like, so many of the problems in the TV series were all about, like, ethical dilemmas being brought up that, like, like Picard was as much of a philosopher and diplomat as he was a military officer, you know what I mean? I really, really liked that. It was really, I don't know, it was really cool. We need more stuff like that. In the next generation, there would be episodes where it was literally just, like, two people on a planet, or, like, two groups of people on a planet are having a conflict, and it's, like, escalating, and people want to, like, you know, wage war on each other, and Picard just acts as a diplomat. And the diplomacy is actually, like, the climax of the story. It's not like he tries to act like a diplomat, but then they have to do, like, a cool break-in where they kill, like, an evil rebel leader or something. The diplomacy in solving the problems is framed as the central conflict of the story, and that's really great. Yeah, The Measure of a Man. There was a whole episode dedicated to legally whether or not an android should be considered a person or property. The entire episode is just ethical arguments being given by different people in the show. That's it. It's just exploring the philosophy of, of, of you know, post-humanism and what it means to, to be a person. It's considered one of the best episodes and no one ever fires a gun. No one ever attacks anyone else. It's just ethics. Like Synths in Fallout 4. Sure, but Fallout, all Fallout games... I mean, you solve a lot of problems by shooting people there. You know? Have I seen Picard? No. Where am I going next? Do you think the transporter kills you and makes a copy somewhere else? That is an, a question I'm in, incapable of answering. That's It's such a... complicated question. I don't know. I don't think there's a way of knowing. It might legitimately be beyond the realm of human knowledge to understand whether or not... to know whether or not that's true. You a fan of Red Letter Media? Um, I've only ever seen the Plinkett reviews, the very old ones, like a decade old, you know? I guess that depends on if you believe in the soul. Yeah, well, I guess the question is about continuity, right? Like, you know how sometimes people, like, experience temporary, like, bodily death, but then they get brought back to life? Is that thing that's brought back to life the same person as the one before? Or is it just a new entity that has all the memories as the one before, you know? Or, I guess the question would be, if you created a clone of somebody which was physiologically identical in every way, and then both you and the clone woke up from sleep, like the cloning process puts you both to sleep, and you both woke up, what difference would there be between the two of you and follow-up? Uh, you know, it, it, like, w it, if there is a difference of what, per like, what meaning is it, you know? Yeah, it's the teleportation problem. 
can I can I give you guys my answer? Okay. This question is one of the things that legitimately makes me wonder about like um, metaphysics and the possibility of the existence of a soul. The universe is very complicated and there's a lot of stuff that we legit just don't get. Like dark matter, for example, which seems to be something which interacts with gravity but doesn't interact with a bunch of other metrics we normally use to analyze like empirical stuff, you know? I have no idea how you would ever even look into something like this. Yeah, and dark energy as well. It seems like there are probably a lot of elements to the universe that we're not capable of fathoming with the equipment and the perception that we possess. You know, not just like we can't see ultraviolet light, because we can measure it still, but there might be things that exist but literally aren't measurable through tools that we have at all. You know, like we, we, we might be, um, you know? So if dark matter can interact with gravity but nothing else, is it possible that there is some metaphysical force, or at least it's metaphysical to us, which can interact with consciousness but nothing else? Something that exclusively has influence over our ability to perceive and understand the world, but can't be registered through any other type of, you know, um, uh, measuring ability. It's not impossible. It's also not really possible to prove. So, I stand by my sort of, I don't know, um, agnostic position on metaphysics where I genuinely don't think there's much of a point in forming strong statements about anything like this, but it's interesting to think about, and I guess like, how do I put this? For, for you as a person, you would never be able to tell the difference between being the clone and being the person who had lived up until that point, right? Like, if you both woke up at the same time, you would not know which one you were, and there would be no way to know which one you were. Likewise, you don't know if every morning when you wake up, you're a new person who only has memories of a previous life, or if you're that same life. We don't even know what the difference between those two things are. We don't, we don't even know what the difference is, right? So here's the question. What break in consciousness is sufficient to consider death? Like, if you're briefly knocked unconscious, while well, your brain activity is still going on, sure, but, you know, you're not aware of it. Or I guess every nanosecond that passes, you know, atoms and molecules move around in your brain. Like, is that not damage? Not in like a biological sense, you know, but is that not damage in like an intrinsic physiological way? It, it, like every second that passes your brain, its specific orientation of molecules is very different from the one that was in the previous second. And is that death? Is that a different person? What determines the state of, of having one's consciousness broken, you know? You have the ship of Theseus thing, right? Where like seven years, your cells replace. The answer to these questions is objective in that we can't form answers to these questions. <laughs> we don't know, we have no idea. All I know is that from where I'm standing, where, where, where I think I am, I think that I go to sleep and wake up the next morning, and I think I remember who I am, and I think there is continuity of form and of, persons, uh, of personhood. But I genuinely don't know, and I don't think I'm ever gonna know. That's subjective, not objective. Well, I am being very objective when I say that there's no way for us to know an objective answer to that question. Hence my agnosticism. You understand? So, is it possible that there is some sort of... Um, metaphysical force which regulates consciousness and does not interact with matter in other ways we can perceive? Sure. But I can't prove that, and we can't know that, so... You know.